Good evening and welcome. Uh, we appreciate you coming. Um, my name is Sean Corsandi, and I'm the Executive Director of Landmark West, your good government grassroots preservation and land use nonprofit serving the Upper West Side from 59th Street to 110th Street, Scenic Landmark Riverside Park through Scenic Landmark Central Park. We are co-hosting tonight's event with our colleagues at Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts and are joined by Nua Ansari, Megan Fitzpatrick, Sarah McCulley, Andra Moss, and Anna Markham, who you'll be hearing from in a moment. We all want to welcome you tonight to City of Yes. What is it and what will it mean to you? For our first timers, this event is being recorded and tomorrow morning it'll be lightly edited and a version will be sent to all of you for rewatching. Uh, it's also going to be made public on both of our websites, so not to fear if you miss anything tonight. If you have a question, please pop it into the chat at the bottom uh, of your screen. Uh, after our presentation, there will be opportunities for Q&A. If you'd like to ask George a question, just raise your virtual hand. It's a function that you can find in your bottom toolbar under reactions, and we'll do your best, our best to call on you in order. Now, why exactly are we here tonight? As the city evolves, so does preservation. And there's a piece in the New York Times art architecture column from the 70s that always rings true for me, particularly tonight. The late great Otto Louise Huxtable wrote an article on March 7th, 1971, titled Thinking Man's Zoning. It's printed on page 22, tight to the gutter, and it reads in part, quote, Revolution is not always a call to the barricades. Some revolutions can even put you to sleep. Try reading zoning law, for example. It's as dry as dust and dull as the law books and a numbers game to the uninitiated. To grasp the importance of zoning, start with the premise that the city you see is to a great extent the city that zoning makes. Zoning does not solve social, racial, or other urban ills. It tells builders how they can build, largely in terms of height and bulk. All new construction is shaped by this quote." End quote. The code she's referring to is the New York City Zoning Code, largely adopted in 1961. It's more than 1,300 pages have been dissected, amended, challenged, followed, abused, and ignored. But since 1961, there's never been one single initiative, such as the mayor's city of yes, which seeks to so comprehensively override the many basic protections, such as separation of use, which is a foundation hallmark of zoning. On Wednesday, December 8th, city of yes for carbon neutrality passed. On Wednesday, January 24th, city of yes for economic opportunity will be heard, and we still await the language for city of yes for housing opportunity. There is some good in the text, but also some potentially bad and some potentially even worse. As a citywide amendment, opposition to neighborhood specific challenges will easily be drowned out because no one community will have the majority voice. So it's best we all understand what lies ahead. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Anna Markham, the Executive Director of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Markham. I'm the executive director of Friends of the Upper East Side, um, an organization founded in 1982 as an independent nonprofit membership organization dedicated to preserving the architectural legacy, livability, and sense of place of the Upper East Side. We are thrilled to host George James tonight, the principal of George M. James and Associates, a specialty planning firm. James has over 20 years of experience and often works with local governments, community boards, and community groups to help them understand how new development proposals, plans, and regulations will impact their community or, or to them shape plans or regulations that serve their needs. James founded J, J M, not J, excuse me, GMJ and A in 2008 after spending six years as executive director of New York City's Environmental Simulation Center a pioneer in the world of visualization and simulation in planning and development. George James is one of the most valuable resources of the New York City historic preservation community. And we are so thrilled to have him here tonight to explain to us the nitty gritty of City, and yes, City of Yes. And with that, I hand it over to you, George. Wow, uh, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I am so glad to be here. Um, I've been spending so much time with City of Yes stuff um, and talking with community boards and anybody who's interested in listening, listening to it because it's zoning and zoning is dry and difficult 
Um, but as Sean said, that, that was a great quote, Sean. I, it's so important because it shapes our city. So um, before we get into the details, though, I want to talk a little bit about where uh, City of Yeses come from, or at least some of the details in it. So in May 2022, Mayor Adams and Governor Hochul announced New New York, which is, in fact, in the press release called a blue ribbon panel in the title. Um, and the panel was set up to reimagine how and where people work. The new New York panel included some of the biggest names in industry. It's, it's all on their website. You have bankers, the CEO of Goldman Sachs is on it, real estate. You have Tishman Spire and Durst Organization, venture capitalists, Techs and tech and pharmaceutical CEOs, lots of CEOs from all uh, from from all over the place, education, um, hospitals, and then also there were many several former Bloomberg administration officials honored as well. And this panel uh, came up with a plan, making New York work for everyone. Uh, December twenty twenty two, it came out. It has forty separate initiatives, mostly mostly about streamlining regulations in New York City. Um, the plan calls for changes to regulations that impact how we both live and work. Um, this plan was developed without any public input. Um, it wasn't asked for, it wasn't given, though they did interview some selected people. Also in 2022, the mayor set up BLAST, which stands for the Building and Land Use Approval Streamlining Task Force. Uh, BLAST was set up to, quote, cut red tape, streamline processes, and remove administrative burdens. Um, BLAST was different than New New York because it was government-led, and then the different agencies in government consulted with 50 corporations uh, on their administrative burdens when they're dealing with the city. Um, so they're mostly real estate um, and then the people who work for real estate. Uh, BLAST made 111 separate recommendations to deregulate the city. Uh, there was no public involvement during this process. And together, these deregulation efforts are called city of yes. And I use the term deregulation because that's what the city calls city of yes when they're uh, presenting it at public meetings. Deregulation, streamlining, cutting red tape. You know, we've been conditioned to think of these actions as good things, things that make our government and lives more efficient. And maybe sometimes that's true, but I'd like to reflect for a moment on regulations. The Upper East and Upper West Sides of Manhattan are two of the most densely populated neighborhoods in America, and some of the most densely populated in the world. We live in buildings that are packed together, which soar hundreds of feet into the air, and every day we get into elevators, tiny metal boxes suspended over deep shafts without any thought that they're safe. You know, that's a minor miracle in my book. Um, we don't worry about our buildings falling down, or our food is safe to eat, or our water is good to drink. We know if there's a fire or an accident or a medical emergency, there will be help coming. So many worries about our daily life that we could have, we don't have because of regulations. Regulations are there to take care of the details so we don't have to think about them most of the time. And the new New York panel is right. Our urban environment is heavily regulated. And to that I say, thank goodness. It is heavily regulated so that the rest of us don't have to worry about living our lives. So personally, I'm suspicious whenever anybody uses the term deregulation in a generically positive way. While the details matter, Deregulation is often a bad thing, especially if it is being pushed for the wrong reasons. If corporations in highly regulated industries don't like their regulatory environment, 
That's completely understandable. But that doesn't mean that the regulations are bad and they should change. Of course, the folks that are paying for regulations want less of them. They cost money. But for most regular people, that's money well spent. And so when it comes to land use and zoning, City of Yes streamlines a host of approvals, creates shortcuts for others. Is it always a good thing to streamline the land use process in New York City? How does that public benefit from that? Uh, if projects spend less time in public review, have less public input, is that a good thing? Is it a good thing to have less environmental review as City of Yes is currently proposing? I would say, not usually, but certainly the details matter. And sometimes the world changes and the regulations need to change to keep up with changes in technology and policy. And so case in point, green buildings and renewable energy generation. So New York City Council passed local laws that require the phase out of, of building emissions and in, lar in larger buildings. And um, new buildings in New York City must now be all electric. And these new policies require other changes in our regulations. And that came City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality. Um, City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality was a series of zoning amendments to facilitate green building, green buildings. And as Sean said, um, it became law about a month ago or last month. Um, and it includes these new allowances for solar, mechanical equipment, battery storage systems. And you kind of expect to see, we're going to see a lot more solar in the city. Enormous rooftop mechanical systems, solar canopies like you're seeing here. Um, but today, we're not going to focus on that uh, because this came law and this is, this is no longer something that we can affect easily. Um, we're going to affect, we're going to be focusing on changes that are still in process. And the one that's in process right now is City of Yes for Economic Opportunity. It's a massive change, as Sean was saying, to the, to the city's zoning. It's 1,127 pages long of zoning text. It's easily the largest change to the city's zoning since 1961. Some of it addresses sorely needed updates. Other parts are tweaks and reorganization. Um, and still other parts are radical changes. And so tonight, um, knowing that you're all not necessarily zoning um, experts or may even mavens, uh, we're just going to focus on the parts of it that you may notice in the neighborhood. So I'm going to go through uh, several one by one. And the first one is home occupations. So currently in New York City, we allow home occupations but there are regulations that govern them. Meaning occupations are, home occupations are, are businesses you run out of your home. So you can have no more than one outside employee at any given time, no more than 25% of the unit and no more than 500 square feet can be used for the business. And uh, the following uses are prohibited in the home. You can't have your barber shop or beauty parlor, commercial stable or kettle. Um, some offices are also not allowed in there. It's, it's a kind of random list of, of uses, some of which seem to make sense and some of which are kind of peculiar. Um, and this, you know, this, this comes from decades old um, zoning policy. And so the change is City of Yes wants to relax a lot of these regulations. So you increase the outside employees to three from one. Um, increase the max size of the business from 49% from 25%. You remove the absolute size restriction. Um, and then the list of prohibited home, home occupations is removed. Um, so you could have, in the future, you could have um, a barbershop or a beauty salon with three outside employees in your apartment. Uh, there is no restriction regarding traffic or the number of customers served. Um, and then if the building rules or lease allows it, a person can open a barbershop, the veterinarian medicine office, photography studio. Really, it's most any um, commercial use, or even some small-scale manufacturing in your apartment. Uh, the removal of the hard size limit, this is one of my concerns, is that the removal of the hard size limit could encourage 
owners from purchasing to purchase neighboring units so they can expand for their business, which is bad for housing. If you're buying your neighboring unit, that means there's one less unit for housing. Okay, that was one. Number two, manufacturing. So City of Yes includes a major change in where man manufacturing uses can locate. So currently, most manufacturing uses have to locate in districts zoned M for manufacturing. On the Upper East and Upper West Side, there are very, very few. Um, by John Jay Park, there's a Con Ed plant. There's, I think there's another Con Ed plant on the, the far west side. And there are a couple of scattered M zones. There are very few, though, generically. So there's very few places that um, manufacturing uses can operate on the Upper East and Upper West Side. City of Yes is proposing to change that so that manufacturing uses can locate in any commercial district, including neighborhood commercial districts. So where are those? Um, they're on mostly avenues. So First Avenue, Second Avenue, Third Avenue, Lexington, Madison, Columbus, Amsterdam, Broadway. Um, think about the Lincoln Square area, you have a whole bunch. Um, uh, down closer to, to Midtown, you also have a lot of the commercial areas. So these can be uses that serve the community like bakeries and brew pubs. So that have like manufacturing in the back and you have a retail component in the front, which I think no one would have a problem with, but that is not a requirement of the zoning. These establishments do not have to be open to the public. And when I say almost any, most manufacturing uses, I really do mean that machinery manufacturing, fabricated metal production, electric lighting manufacturing, textile mills, medical equipment, clothing and shoes. It's just like the list is very, very long and these could operate in your local commercial districts. Uh, and you know, my, my concern is, is that these, along with some other new uses we're gonna be talking about, um, may make it harder to locate services that serve neighborhood residents. So. Now, many local governments are moving away from zoning that separates uses um, and moving towards zoning that regulates form. This is called form-based zoning. So this change is consistent with that trend. But neighborhood commercial districts in Manhattan are designed to serve the needs of neighborhood residents. Um, and in Manhattan, we walk to those needs, right? And so in these other places in auto-oriented USA, it doesn't necessarily matter where these uses are. You just get in your car and you go another few blocks. But we're walking to these places. And if these spaces start getting filled up by uses that don't serve the needs of the neighborhood, this could be a serious inconvenience for everyone that lives in the neighborhoods. And you know, one of the things that um, the city is doing is it's requiring um, the commercial streets, all the commercial streets to have certain urban design criteria. Um, one of them is our transparency or essentially show windows, glass walls facing the street. But glass walls, show windows do not necessarily equal activity or vital street fronts. This is Park Avenue at 122nd Street. These are all manufacturing businesses with um, street walls, right? And, and if you ever come up this way, Park Avenue at 121st, 122nd, there's no one on the street here because there's no reason to be on the street because it's all manufacturing uses at this in this area. Okay. Number three, agriculture. And you're, I, I'm sure there's somebody going, agriculture? Why are we talking about agriculture in New York City? But it is a use and it's something that I think um, might affect some people. Okay. So currently, agricultural uses are allowed anywhere if they are open and unenclosed. Um, I guess it happens some places, um, but it's not common. Enclosed agricultural uses need to be in an M zone or an area for industrial uses. That's the way it works now. City of Yes permits enclosed agricultural uses anywhere even in residential districts. 
And agricultural buildings can often be larger than the residential buildings they would be located next to and compete with residential buildings for space. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that cannabis, cannabis cultivation would qualify as an agricultural use. And so you could have like these prepackaged cannabis grow rooms and vertical farms that could locate in, in any district. I mean, in, in anywhere in New York City. Um, City of Yes would also permit the sale of goods grown on site, but not shipped in from other locations. Though, of course, if it was cannabis, you probably need a state license for that. Now, honestly, this seemed so absurd to me. I thought it was a mistake. And I was like, oh, come on. This can't be what's actually being proposed um, to put industrial scale agriculture in residential districts, or at least permit it. Um, but it, it, it appears to have been intentional. And, you know, I will acknowledge is that I don't expect something like this to happen on the Upper East and Upper West Side, at least not at any scale. But, you know, it may very well happen in other parts of New York City. And it is something that I think if you are concerned about housing, um, you should be concerned about uses that compete with housing generically in the city. Okay, number four, nightclubs. So our regulations currently have made nightclubs very hard to cite in New York City. And City of Yes removes nearly all the restrictions that make it hard to cite nightclubs. Um, live musical shows with dancing will be permitted in all commercial districts. The major size is the major limiter. So in neighborhood commercial districts, which you see on First Avenue, Second Avenue, Amsterdam, Columbus, um, you'd be seeing uh, a nightclub could only have 200 person capacity or less. In the higher density commercial areas, which would be Broadway, Madison Avenue, Lincoln Square, they would be of unlimited size. So it would be just governed by the bulk of the facility. And, you know, this is one where I'm hearing all different kinds of um, differences of opinion, because some people say, you know, it's really hard to go hear live music and go dancing in New York City. And they are right. Um, they are really very, they're very, um, they can't really be easily located in the neighborhoods. You got to go to the meatpacking district or places like that. Um, because essentially zoning makes it illegal in the neighborhoods. Amusements. So currently, um, amusement park rides are limited to Coney Island. Um, City of Yes will allow all amusements in more places as long as they're enclosed. So small scale uh, amusements in neighborhood commercial districts, large scale along Madison Broadway and, and Lincoln Square, um, this, this I, I, I picked out this picture here because uh, this ride enclosed in glass has already been proposed in a new hotel on 8th Avenue um, and its illegality is under current zoning has been challenged. Um, but the uh, building department has not answered the challenge to this because essentially they're waiting for City of Yes to pass because once City of Yes passes, um, this ride would be permitted in that hotel as of right um, uh, once, it, once it passes. Um, and it would be, rides like this would be permitted in closed in buildings on Madison Avenue, Broadway, and Lincoln Square. But mostly, I think you're going to see, if this passes, more amusements like indoor playgrounds, which are currently very difficult to locate. You know, my children are a little older now, uh, but, you know, 10 years ago, you know, we, you'd have to go to a different jurisdiction to take your kids to one of these fancy indoor playgrounds because of zoning, they're very, very difficult to cite in New York City right now. Oops, sorry. Microdistribution facilities, number six. So currently, warehouses and distribution centers can only locate in industrial areas. Um, so increased demand for deliveries have created these a demand for what, what has been come known as dark stores in the neighborhood. And 
starting in 2022, the Department of Buildings actually started to allow these. And it was kind of a, a little loophole. Uh, it's, it technically, they have to be open at least partially to the public. So they still qualify as a retail use and not a warehouse use. Um, the city of Yes is permitting, you know, kind of formalizes what the Department of Buildings came up with. Uh, in zoning, which is a good thing. You don't want the building department making up these rules. You want it in zoning. And so the city of Yes is to, going to permit these micro distribution centers uh, as long as they're small, under 2,500 square feet in most places, up to 5,000 in the, again, Broadway, Madison Avenue corridors. And while these take up commercial spaces on the blocks, you know, they could be helpful in getting trucks off the street. Um, you know, I will say anecdotally, I, I know that in my own neighborhood, we would see a lot more trucks on the street in 2020, 2021. And then a few of these opened up and we see less of them. Um, but, you know, I don't know that there's been actually any um, studies to say that that's really affected it, um, but it seems to have anecdotal. Okay, number seven location of commercial uses within buildings. Okay, and this one's gonna be a little bit wonky, but I, I stick with me. So currently on the Upper East and Upper West Side, there, if there is commercial in the building, apartments must always be placed over the commercial uses, never below, never alongside, right? So you can have your residential lobby, you can have your mail room, you can even have your laundry, uh, but you, your dwelling units always have to be above the commercial use. That's the way it works now. City of Yes will allow commercial and most manufacturing uses on the same floor as a dwelling, and in some cases above the dwelling, if there are separate entrances. These, these drawings here, uh, DCP produced, uh, I think they're pretty good. In the neighborhood commercial, generally speaking, you're limited to the first and actually in our neighborhoods, first and second floors, because we're in high density neighborhoods for the most part. Um, and what they're doing, what they're saying is, is that, is that um, you can now share uh, residential and commercial on the same floor. And currently you can't do that as long as they have separate entrances. Um, in the higher density, um, you could have them share on the same floor and even be over the residential, the residential being gray and the commercial being um, this orange color. Um, as long as they have separate entrances um, and, and separate routes of egress. Um, there's also some uh, environmental considerations. Noise generating uses must be separated by 15 feet from a residence or there needs to be sound, vibration and air quality mitigation. So any use allowed in the higher density districts uh, will be permitted above residences, including bars and nightclubs and, and, and you know, with, with outdoor roof decks, something like this, um, manufacturers, uh, commercial kitchens, amusements, and rides, dog kennels, basically every, anything except these heavy industrial uses, which are still limited to the M districts. Now there are environment, environmental protections for vibration, noise, and air quality that are written into the zoning, but they only apply to units in the same building, not neighboring buildings. They do not include other nuisance issues like odor or traffic or other objectionable effects. Usually there's a long list of things that, um, you know, are listed in, in things that could have nuisances, but this is just vibration, noise, and air quality. And in what seems like a drafting error, smaller commercial uses, uses under 75 person capacity are entirely exempted from all environmental standards. And that doesn't make any sense because it doesn't matter how big something is, it matters how much of a nuisance it creates. And again, but this is both in the higher density areas, again, Broadway, uh, Madison Avenue, Lincoln Square areas, and the areas close to Midtown, because this is where you could get to the roof in those districts. Okay, so number eight, research laboratories. Um, 
City of Yes would allow for research laboratories in all Manhattan commercial districts. And, and I'm gonna ask you to stick with me on this one because again, this is another pretty wonky one. Um, up until 2016, regulations required research laboratories to locate in industrial areas. And this was a problem because New York City strategically wanted to focus on the life science industry and putting them in the industrial areas wasn't working. So in 2016, the city published this memo that said research laboratories could go into many, but not all commercial districts. It was an interpretation that was formalized in, in this memo. And so the city of Yes, however, will replace this interpretation and permit research laboratories in all Manhattan commercial districts. Um, also in 2016, um, the New York City Department of Mental Health and Hygiene sponsored a change to the New York City Health Code that required certain research laboratories to register with the city, writing when it was justifying this change to the health code. The department is concerned that an accident in a New York City based high containment research laboratory could have catastrophic consequences. Now, if you actually read what they wrote, they list all of these accidents and that have happened in research laboratories around the country and the world. And it's actually kind of terrifying. Um, and the Department of Health, when I asked, the Department of Health refused to publicly release the list of facilities that have had to register with it, calling that the release of such information an untenable security risk. That is the language that they used in writing to me. So on one hand, City of Yes says, let's make these things really easy to cite. Let's put them basically anywhere. Well, on the other hand, the city is saying that these facilities are too dangerous to even disclose and an accident could cause catastrophic consequences. Now, listen, I have no expertise in this area, right? I, I don't know anything about medical research or these facilities, but I do find the lack of consistent messaging from the different departments in New York City government concerning. Um, and also, you know, I brought this up and the city barely acknowledges the department's health concern. And it does not appear, at least the last time I've, I've heard, does not plan on making any changes to this. Okay, and so since uh, we're on the Upper East and Upper West Side, a lot of people here from there, um, there's a spe I, I, there's so many changes, right? And, and I'm only scratching the surface, but I'm going to scratch the surface on special districts that only exist on the Upper East and Upper West Side. So Madison Avenue, Columbus, Amsterdam, and Broadway, um, they have special zoning districts that only apply on those streets. And the City of Yes are changing special zoning districts throughout the city. So many of them are changing, and these are changing as well. And I'm going to go through the changes that only affect these streets. So Madison Avenue Special District was designed in 1973 to protect Madison Avenue's character as a premier shopping street. So many commercial uses that are usually permitted in commercial areas are prohibited on the ground floor of Madison Avenue. So things like offices, print shops, catering halls, all hosts of wholesale uses, gymnasiums, you know, things like that, you know, health clubs, stuff like that. Uh, City of Yes eliminates all the use restrictions that are custom for Madison Avenue. And it replaces them with new generic restrictions, which will actually apply to all commercial districts. Um, and there are limits on, on the location of parking and curb cuts. Uh, there's these limitations are also no ground floor dwelling. So we're saying that you cannot have a dwelling unit front facing um, on a commercial street. Um, there are also limits on lobby size. So your residential lobby cannot be uh, very large on the street. Um, there are also requirements for transparency, um, these glass storefronts that we've, we've been talking about. 
And, and then on top of that, not, including you know the removal of of the, these restrictions, City of Yes adds the new uses we've just discussed. So nightclubs, amusements, micro distribution, most manufacturing uses. Now I'm not don't, not thinking that manufacturing uses are going to move into uh, Madison Avenue, but it would be permitted under current zoning, uh, under proposed zoning, sorry, city of yes zoning. All right, so in 2012, the enhanced commercial districts were mapped on Broadway, Columbus, and Amsterdam. Um, and these were designed to encourage small scale retail by limiting the establishment size on Columbus and Amsterdam, and then also certain uses like banks, right? They, this was, you know, banks were too big. Um, this was an example that was used at the time, this Chase Bank, it had a very big storefront. And the idea was, was that you wanted to keep banks down to no more than 25 feet of frontage on the commercial street, though it could be um, larger on the second floor. So here, the city of Yes eliminates uh, most of the custom rules but keeps the size restrictions on Columbus and Amsterdam, meaning you can't have big storefronts on Columbus and Amsterdam. Though um, the rules are replaced with the new generic rules that we were just discussing on, on Madison. So there's, tra there's transparency requirements, curb cut limitations, parking limitations, and then the size of the, the dwelling or size of the, um, the lobby uh, limitations. And, you know, the, in some ways, this is an, a, an example of success because a lot of the rules that were in the enhanced commercial district were taken and put into these generic rules that apply everywhere because they worked generally. Um, but I will say that the limit on the size limit on banks has been removed entirely. So banks can still go back to or can go back to the way they were and take up large amounts of retail frontage on these streets. And then more to come. Um, the city of Yes for Housing Opportunity will be the third major uh, portion of this in the zoning resolution. Um, and it would be a also a major change, like on the scale that we're talking about with economic opportunity. But it hasn't started the review process yet. We do know something about it because this uh, environmental scoping document has been released. And these two images were taken from it and it describes basically what's in there, but we don't have the details on what the actual zoning text set, says. It's supposed to be starting review in a few months. And, you know, I'll just you know, include part of the major changes. Um, this is the RAB mid block, the no action scenario versus the with, with action scenario. This is um, a, a, as of right, RAB building that is less than 45 feet wide. Um, it's limited to 60 feet because it's less than 45 feet wide. It is subject to the sliver rule, which means that it can be no taller than the width of the street in front of it. Um, and it's going to change it if it has affordable housing in it. It could go up to 105 feet um, in with action conditions. And there's a lot of changes that will be coming like this. And, and it's radical. Like you know, their height factor zoning change it goes away. Sliver goes away. 20% bonuses for all buildings that include affordable housing throughout the city and lots of changes to the outer boroughs. Um, so, but, you know, that's all I'm going to go into today because that was a lot. And I know that there's probably a lot of questions and I'd like to hear from you all. Wonderful. So if you guys have any questions for George, please go ahead and drop them in the chat. Oh, there's a lot in the chat. Um, do you want to oh, go through I them? I can go ahead and read you. I have already picked out a couple, so I'll okay, go great. ahead and read you a few. I figured we'd start out with a more general one. Um, which of these proposed changes do you think will have the most tangible impact on daily life in our neighborhoods? Um, so I, I think you got to take them together. Um, I think the, when you take the amusements, when you take the, um, the dark stores, when you take the nightclubs, 
uh, when you take the manufacturing, you put them all up together. That's a whole bunch of new uses that can locate in your neighborhood commercial districts, right? So right now there's, there's uh, it's been said that there is a vacancy crisis and, um, and there's a lot of vacancies. And so what we've done is we're saying that there's going to be all these new uses that can operate, that, that can occupy the, the ground floor. And that may, um, that may address the vacancy crisis, but it also may push out uses that are important for our daily lives. You know, Amazon hasn't figured out how to deliver my haircut yet, right? Um, and there are lots of things that we need in our neighborhood so that we can live. And when we have more and more uses that are not necessarily addressing our daily needs, well, that may affect, um, and it's really convenience more than anything. But for some people, especially those with mobility disabilities, um, it could be more than that. Okay, I see, I see. Um, speaking of the uh, vacancy crisis, what do you think is the city's actual motive for the City of Yes initiative? Who do you think this will benefit the most? So, I, I mean, the city is, uh, I mean, they've said that they're doing this because there is a vacancy crisis. Um, that's one of the reasons um, that they've said, they've said this. And they started all of their presentations talking about you know, what the vacancy rates are in the different neighborhoods that they're in. Uh, and so, you know, vacancies hurt uh, landowners, vacancies hurt um, their bankers and lenders. Uh, and, you know, you know, I, I'm not a, a financier, I, I am not a, 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 a landlord, but, you know, I also know one way to address the vacancy crisis would be to lower the rent. And if you lower the rent, you will mm -hmm. um, fill up some of your spaces. So I, I think, you know, the city is, is you know, if you look at the, the new New York panel and who's on it, it's full of real estate interests and bankers. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, that's who's coming up with the plans. I think, you know, that's who's primarily who's the, the interests that are being served. You know, that's me. You know, there, there may be people who are more sophisticated, who have um, um, a more nuanced look at it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we just got a great question from Beth um, Rosenblum in the audience. Who is the approving body for these zoning changes? Oh, okay. Does the public um, so, have an opportunity to formally weigh in? Um, and if you could expand on that. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So zoning is law. Um, and there is a process in New York City um, called the uh, Uniform Land Use Review Pro Procedure. Um, and these have to go through um, a very similar procedure uh, to that, uh, which is our land use procedure, um, where uh, the community boards, it gets referred to the community boards, the community boards comment on it. It goes to the city planning commission. The city planning commission can amend it. They could care, send it forward. You could vote it down. It could send it forward to city council. City council has an opportunity to make changes and then ultimately city council will vote on it. So right now, um, we're at the very end of the community board period. So, uh, some of the, many of the community boards have submitted their comments. Some still have to submit comments are supposed to submit them by the, I believe it's the first week in February. Um, and there is a um, city planning commission public hearing that is happening on the 24th next week. Um, and you can speak at it. Um, it's being scheduled for eight hours right now. I'm sure Anna and Sean will be able to provide the information. Um, I encourage people to participate in these things, right? They need to hear from people. Um, they need to hear from regular people. That's part of what the community board does, but they also need to hear from people from everyone. And there's no such thing as, as too much public comment. And then ultimately your elected officials, right? So your elected officials have the final say, your council members. And they will be voting on this um, and they will be have the opportunity to make changes to it. So, you know, I focus on a lot of things that um, I, you know, I thought you might see changes on things that I think are problematic. There are also things in here that are good. All right. Let me just say that is that. Our uses in the zoning resolution, you know, are basically a relic from the 1950s are ridiculous. You know, we could still 
place uh, telegraph offices, you know, and umbrella repair shops. It's it's astounding. We just haven't updated them in any mm-hmm. serious way. And this, the way that it updates it, it's smart. Smart people worked on it. And so there are a lot of things here that are good. Uh, but, you know, I, I didn't focus on those today. So to be fair, I need to, you know, throw that out there. Mm-hmm. Yes, I remember in going to a city planning commission meeting, they stated that there were a lot of rules around where typewriter repair shops yeah. <laughs> could go while um, sort of prohibiting certain uses of uh, other tech, such as like cell phone repair shops or other things like that. Yeah, so, right. um, yeah, that was going to be another question I had for you was um, what are the, the good things? And um, it's true, you know, like this code did need updating. Um, but, uh, one thing I have a question for you about is the comments from the community board. If we get in touch with them and all that stuff, what kind of impact do you think those will have on the final zoning resolution that's passed? Um, well, Mm -hmm. you know, my opinion has been is that lately, um, the department of city planning who came up with the zoning has been kind of responsive to comments. They've been, Mm -hmm. they've actually made some changes, um, uh, based upon comments and, and, you know, if the comments are detailed and constructive, this is a bad idea for um, this reason, uh, then they actually may consider it. Uh, but, you know, the community board is only advisory, but I always encourage community boards to give detailed responses and rationales for their recommendation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that also that's perfect. for everybody, right? I mean, that's not mm-hmm. just a community board, that's everybody. Yes, that makes perfect sense. And of course, to everybody in the audience, we will be following up with, um, there's already a link in the chat, but we will be following up with information on how you can sign up to testify at the hearing next week. So that's something that everybody should, you know, keep in mind. Um, I have one other question. Some people are curious if there is any um, sort of federal government oversight in any of this changing, such as with environmental impact studies. Um, Some people asked about the National Register of Historic Places, Section 106, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, this is this is all local. This is all local laws. Um, This is uh, zoning, New York City zoning. It's home rule and everything within their jurisdiction. I mean, you know, there are there are, like for the thing on research laboratories, there are licensing requirements at the state and federal. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, there are, you know, there are, but that exists separately, right? That's not about, you know, uh, where they locate. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. And earlier when you were talking about the darker storefront, the, the, the dark storefronts that are more so sort of like suppliers for orders within the area, um, somebody in the chat asked uh, what you think Hello? this proposal will do to small Speaking businesses of... in the area, if it will be um, more beneficial, or if perhaps opening everything up to all of these different uses will create an unnecessarily competitive market for small businesses. Well, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, ultimately, if, you, if you're including all of these other uses to take up space, what does that do to the market for um, rent for the small business on the storefront. You know, I, I, it's something that I don't know enough about that. I'm not an economist. Mm -hmm. I I don't, I don't follow the markets, but you know, if you have a lot more people competing for the same amount of space, um, generally speaking that, you know, rents go up, um, uh, at least that's that's typically how it is. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, one thing I, I, I know a question that I often get, if I can just answer it right now, um, is, um, so the home occupation thing, right? The, the rules, the zoning is completely overridden by building rules or lease agreements. Um, so if you're building rules or your co-op or your condo say you can't do it, you can't do it. It doesn't matter what the zoning says. Um, if it's more restrictive, right? If it's more restrictive, you can't do it. But, you know, one of the things you may have to do if like you're on your co-op board is look at your rules, right? You probably haven't looked at your rules in a long time. And, you know, sometimes they have, you know, you have to follow the law, right? And, or something generic that evolves when the law changes. Well, this is changing the law. And you should, if you're concerned about it, um, you should 
review your co-op rules or your, and, and see if, you know, see how they deal with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. For, I see. for home occupation, home occupation specifically. Okay. So you would recommend that folks who live in a co-op building sort of just before this passes or um, just in their next meeting, kind of look at what those kind of rules are and see if they need to strengthen them. Well, I mean, if they, if they have concerns, they might not have concerns, right? I mean, that's just it is that, is that I'm just saying that your rules trump the zoning, right? And so if you don't like the zoning in your building, you can um, write new rules to make it more restrictive than the zoning. Okay, I see. I see. That makes sense. Um, uh, somebody, let me see. I'm trying to find yet another question. Just hold on one moment. So, so one of the things I, I, you know, while while you're looking for a, for a question, is is to just talk a little bit more about about your council members, because ultimately, where changes have happened recently in when we get these citywide text amendments, they mostly happen with the city council, because right now we are reviewing something that the city administration wants to see happen. And while there are sometimes changes that are made, um, and important changes that are made because of mistakes or reconsiderations or comments that they're hearing from the community, it's basically something that they want, the administration. So you don't see, generally speaking, major changes from DCP or the CPC, but you can see major changes from city council. Your council members are really important in this process. And during zoning for quality and affordability, which was a last big one in 2016, you know, the city council took a, a, a red pen to it and they made a lot of changes. I wouldn't say actually a lot of changes, but they made a, they made big changes, uh, changes to mm -hmm. things that they had heard were problematic. And so if there are things that you have issues with, yes, testify at the, the, the CPC, but do not forget your council member because your council mm -hmm. member is the one um, who has uh, the most power here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. Be loud and very annoying. The squeaky wheel does get the grease in these situations. Um, George, I know that you spoke with the council um, about the zoning for carbon neutrality plan when they were going over uh, sort yeah. of the ins and outs of each of this. And we have somebody in the audience that's curious if the council has asked for your input yet on the economic opportunity plan. I, no, but that's not unusual either because they come last, right? And the CPC mm -hmm. hasn't even seen this yet. And they don't know um, what changes, if any, this, the CPC and DCP are going to make, right? So they don't even have the version that they're going to get. Um, so... You know, I, I understand that, the, you know, there's a land use division at, at city council. They have very smart, very experienced people there. They're going to be going over this very closely. There's um, they have asked me for, you know, input in the past. I hope that they ask me again. I will offer it if, if you know, I will make myself available um, mm -hmm. if they ask. Amazing. We love to hear it. Um uh, we got a question about the previously passed um, zoning for carbon neutrality yeah. um, and the changes passed relating to building electrification and energy efficiency yeah. with the zoning deduction bonus and that kind of thing. Do you foresee any kind of grace periods for these type of passages sort of coming back um, in regards to like the previous zone green methodology or any other further opportunities for change there? Oh, right. Okay. So. All right, so that, that's kind of an into weeds question, but right now there is a um, uh, a period of time where you could use one or the other um, because there were some complaints by architects saying, well, you know, I've designed this building to follow the zone green rules and now you're changing the rules um, and, and it upsets the design of my building. And so essentially they're allowing those buildings to go forward that have already started the process and have been designed. And I don't exactly know the details behind that, but they've essentially structured it in a way that's not going to negatively affect buildings that, you know, have been designed but haven't yet 
started construction. Um, mm -hmm. But that will be, you know, that's a relatively short period of time, right? And it really affects only a few uh, buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that you've touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear you expand a little bit more. Um, how do you think that the um, uh, sort of City of Yes zoning for economic opportunity and City of Yes um, housing affordability will work together? I know we don't have the exact text of housing affordability just yet, yeah. but do you think these proposals play nicely together? Um, and what do you foresee kind of being either the greatest benefits or the biggest clashes between these two sets of proposals? So, I mean, one of the, the uh, I mean, they're, they're going to have to work together, uh, Anna, because, <laughs> um, you know, the, the thing about economic opportunity was that was shocking to me was that it was actually pretty anti-housing because we're prohibiting housing on the ground floor in commercial districts. We're allowing the expansion of home occupations to take over units um, next door to them. We're allowing cannabis or other agricultural uses in residential zones. Why are we having agricultural uses compete with housing in New York City, for goodness sake? You know, I, you know, it's and that's that's a primary use, right? You could mm -hmm. still do your your, you know, your greenhouse or your garden as an accessory use, that's, you've always been able to do that. This is about like building a building solely for growing stuff. I, I just, mm -hmm. it's one of, I don't know why that's a good idea for New York City in a residential zone when you want more residences, right? Why, why mm -hmm. compete like that? It, it just, and there's, you know, there's a few things. It's like not major stuff. But there are a few things. It's like, why would you do that if your focus is housing? And what and DCP's response, to be fair, is, well, you know, we designed this along with housing opportunity. It's just that housing opportunity hasn't started yet. And housing opportunity is going to give a lot more opportunity for housing. Again, it's a major change in the outer boroughs, which... Um, you know, all of the most recent zoning changes really haven't affected. Um, all that mm -hmm. much. And, uh, you know, this, the bonus, the 20% bonus for, um, you know, all buildings with affordable housing, that's a, that's a, that's a big change from what we do now. And that could mm -hmm. actually produce um, a significant amount of housing. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys heard it all here. Um, I, we are reaching the end of our hour. So I just wanted to thank George again for um, coming out and, um, offering us a great explainer on all things City of Yes. I'm sure we will have him back again once the city drops the, I'm sure, 1,000 plus page zoning resolution on housing affordability. So keep an eye out for that. And of course, after this meeting, um, tomorrow we will be following up with information on how um, you can look at the source material and also uh, uh, sort of see if you can testify at the city planning commission as well. Absolutely. And if you have questions, reach out, you know, you know, things come to you, um, you know, don't be a stranger. Yep, definitely. Well, okay. but now, will this recording be available to us and how can we access it? Yes, this recording will be available online. Again, in the email that we send out after this sort of thanking you for attending there is a link to to the video as well so you'll be you'll be getting a link to that okay thank you okay thank you everyone